I'll talk to you for a minute about salvation thieves, what I like to call salvation thieves. I've seen this thing um, from people, and it can be good, it can be bad. Uh, they'll do this little analogy. They'll say, I want to explain to you about salvation. What is biblical salvation? Let's just say salvation is like this pen that I'm holding in my hands. And God puts out, holds this thing out, and He says to you, if you want it, come and take it. It's a free gift. It's all yours. You know, and they do this kind of a thing and they say, you know, all you got to do is just take it. It's a free gift. You don't have to do anything for it. I'm giving it to you for free. Once I give it to you, I won't ask for it back. It's a free gift right there. Just take it, you know, and is salvation free? Yes. Is it the gift of God? Yes, absolutely. Very true. But the whole thing is salvation is not a physical, tangible object that you can just come and take out of God's hand. And there's a greater problem there that underlies this whole system, this thing of taking salvation. That's why I call them thieves that do this. Uh, let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Show you something kind of interesting here. Go way back to the beginning and then we're going to go way to the end of the Bible. Genesis chapter 3. You have the fall there. Garden of Eden. Look at verse 22 through 24. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Hmm. God did not want man just going over and taking eternal life. Why? Because he wouldn't be redeemed. So he would never die. He'd have eternal life because he ate from the tree of life. But it'd be eternal life as a sinner. That would be a bad thing. <laughs> a very bad thing. Temptations and things like that. I mean, you know, would you really want to live forever as a sinner? No. But when does this tree of life show up again? This is an interesting thing. Back to the book of Revelation. Start in the beginning and end up at the end of the Bible. Revelation chapter 22. And verses 1 and 2. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now there's a whole lot that could be said about it, but the whole point is the tree of life shows up again as you're going into eternity. Here in the book of Revelation, chapter 22. Look at verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. So when people do get eternal life from the tree of life, how are they getting it? They may have right to the tree of life. You see, God is the one that dispenses salvation. I think we can all you know, agree on that. God is the one that's going to give salvation out. It's not up to man to go and say, I'm going to take it. You know, going back to the pen analogy. Where did I put the pen? I must have dropped the pen. But, you know, you put, you hold the, the pen out and you say, all you got to do is take it. Well, that's somewhat dangerous. Romans chapter 10, because this is the big disputed thing. And I'm going to tell you, this is where the false prophets are going to get you. These uh, easy believism heretics. Romans chapter 10. Let's read these disputed verses here. Verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart, which is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Belief and confession are right there in the same thing. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. 
For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, so, well, it's, it's actually a belief from the heart. Well, belief, you have to believe what Jesus Christ did, but it's not enough to just believe it and go, okay, I'm going to take it. No, calling upon the name of the Lord. Pray, ask for salvation. I mean, I mean, show me any place, any dispensation in Scripture where anybody's allowed to just go and just say, salvation's mine. God's not part of the equation. I just believe, you know, an act of my own will here. I'm going to believe and I'm going to say, okay, I believe that he did this thing. So it's mine. It's now mine. I'm forcing God to save me because I have what I've done, my own act. You see, it's not I've prayed some little prayer. And, you know, I'm against the whole thing of just a repetitious prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, you know. Yeah, I, I'm against that. But somebody calling upon the name of the Lord in a sincere heart of belief, where they believe that Jesus died for their sins, and they're, they're down on their knees going, God, please save me. I'm a sinner. I'm wicked. Please, God, save me. God's up there going, I'm not going to listen. I mean, this whole thing is so ridiculous. But look at verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Yes. You aren't going to call on the Lord unless you've believed what he did on the cross for you. You know? And I've heard these little Satanists, they come out and they'll say, well, you know, it's the verse 13 is for people who have already believed in Jesus Christ. Um, well, this isn't some kind of a thing that's separated by a long span of time. You get somebody that hears the gospel and that truly hears it and they go, this is what I've been looking for my whole life. You say, what do I do? Call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. You, you believe he died for your sins? Yeah. You know, well, then ask him for salvation. Call upon him. There's not some special words or whatever else. Just, just pray the best way you know how. Cry out to the Lord. Ask him to save you. Finish the verse. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Okay. Yes. Belief and prayer are right there. It's all the same thing. Right? Same thing as biblical repentance and faith. It's right there. It's the same thing. It's the same time, I should say it that way. Okay, you're coming to the Lord broken. You're saying, you know, there's a spirit of contrition of saying, I've, I've messed up my life. I, I've wronged God. I want to do something, you know, I have a broken contrite spirit here. I want to, I want to do something to, to, you know, change my life, but I can't. I need to be saved. God, please save me and come in and, and clean up, help me clean this life up. Please. You see? You're calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. So important. But salvation thieves, they come along and they have a very, you know, specific reason for wanting to do this. You see, they have certain sins that they aren't willing to, uh, you know, talk about. Just little secret closet sins that they kind of keep well hidden. And uh, they appear nice and white on the outside, but inwardly they're full of dead men's bones. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, you'll find this thing out. I mean, Jack Hiles is a perfect example of this. You know, it came out, you know, after his death, his daughter came out and publicly admitted that, yeah, he was committing adultery, you know, with his, with his deacon's wife. I mean, wicked sinner. Very, very, very wicked man. But he sure could preach, couldn't he? And he preached easy believism. He was a salvation thief, you see. Came to God and he said, you're going to save me. I'm taking salvation. Well, what about that stuff over there? Well, you don't have any right to look at that stuff. I'm going to continue doing what I'm going to do. And you get other people and they say, you know, I'm going to go and I'm just going to be involved in worldly things and I'm going to watch worldly stuff and I'm going to live wickedly and things like that. And I'm saved because of my belief. So well, did you ask the Lord? I don't need to ask the Lord. I don't need to call upon the Lord to be saved. I just believed with my own act of free will. I mean, what are the testimonies of these people? I've been saying that here. What are the testimonies of these people? They come out and just tell you, it's just a, just like this pen here, just take it. Salvation is something you just take. God stopped them from taking eternal life back there in the Garden of Eden. Why? Because they would have taken it and lived as sinners. Just like a lot of these easy believers and people do. 
I'm taking salvation for myself. I'm just going to say, Jesus died on the cross. I believe that. I took it. I'm taking that for my own. And I can go on living in my sin. That's exactly what's going on. Let me show you something interesting. I had a brother bring this up. We see there all through the Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 14, the thing of calling upon the Lord, confessing with your mouth. Uh, well, it's not that important. Oh, yeah, it is. Turn to Philippians. Brother Brian. I, I don't know if you want me to say your last name or not, brother, so I'm just going to, you know, another brother Brian. It's a good name. Brian's a good name. But uh, Philippians chapter 2 wrote this to me in a private message. I just thought this was really good. So I'm going to share this. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, we'll begin in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross." Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, sorry, it's not Emmanuel, every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wait a second. We've got to go back to verse 11 because this is obviously a mistranslation. And that every tongue should, uh, well, no, every heart should believe that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. No, actually, what our text says there is that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, in other words, God is commanding every tongue to confess Jesus Christ, either in this life or at the great white throne judgment. It's that important that God wants to hear people confessing the name of the Lord Jesus Christ with their Tongue, do you understand? It's a real blessing, isn't it? Oh, well, calling upon the name of the Lord, that, that actually means belief from the heart. It doesn't mean anything of the kind, you wicked false prophet. It's confessing with your mouth. Well, Romans chapter 10, uh, Romans chapters 9 through 11 are not for us. <laughs> okay, hyper-dispensational wing nut. Yes, they are. Yes, they absolutely are. Well, it's written to the Jews. Then why is Paul writing to the Gentiles explaining about the Jews? You know, I mean, anybody can read Romans chapter, chapters 9 through 11 and see it's written to Christians, right? My word, explaining about Israel and the, and the relationship God has with Israel and things like this. I mean, you know, I could pick that thing apart so easily, it's ridiculous. I don't even need to go, just read it and you'll see it's written to Christians. My word, oh, let's just cut three chapters out. We believe Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul is our apostle for today, except for Romans chapters 9 through 11. And other things that we might have a problem with. We'll just cut that out and say that's for, you know, the tribulation or something. Wicked, wicked people. Ed Fenninger and, you know, all these other little wicked, fake, false prophets. You know, 45-minute video coming up from faking her here, coming up, I'm sure. And there's others, too. I got my eye on you. Know what I mean? Some of you people that teach against Romans chapter 10. Verses 9 through 13. Which is, oh, it's just belief. It's just belief. And the sinner's prayer is wicked and stuff. I got my eye on you. But just finishing up here. Verse 11. Think about that, brethren. God is literally telling saved people or people that are lost. He's saying, you need to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. He wants you to confess with your mouth. And even lost people one day are going to confess the Lord Jesus Christ. So why would you tell people that to be saved, you don't even have to call upon the name of the Lord. You don't have to confess Jesus Christ with your mouth to be saved. Kind of weird, isn't it? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. One more place to go to. Another place that the hyper-dispensational Satanists will pervert and twist because they can't handle this. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1-4. through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Come back to that. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Okay? That's describing the gospel right there. That's the gospel that Paul declared unto them. But notice within that context, Paul says, unless ye have believed in vain. Could you please show me some place in the scriptures where it says, unless ye have prayed in vain, unless ye have called upon the name of the Lord in vain. When you have somebody that's broken and they need help, they will call for help. But there's an awful lot of people that get themselves into trouble and they'll believe for a little while. But then they stop believing. They lose faith, you know, because they never really did the right thing in the first place. And all these false prophets, you talk to them, they're all childhood conversions. Talk to them. Stephen Anderson, childhood conversion. Ed Fenninger, childhood conversion. How can you come to a place where you understand I'm a sinner, I need to be saved, that wicked, sinful life that I had there, I need to repent and things from what I was doing and the way I was going and everything else just messed my life up. I need to come to Jesus Christ broken and say, God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. How can you do that when you're two years old? You know? And that's why these false prophets never become men in understanding. They're children. Childhood conversions, they're false. They're fake. They can't stand the thought of having to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved and have to say, I'm a sinner. They got pride issues. They have wicked things that they're doing in their life. They don't want to give it up for anything. Yeah. And what are they doing? They're believing in vain. And the people that they're conning into following them, they're believing in vain too. So, that is going to be it for this video. Uh, there's a guy that I'm, I'm praying about naming. Um, he's very, uh, very crafty. A lot of these guys, I've seen this thing for years and years and years. The Lord has showed me this thing where these guys will come out and they'll spend a couple years doing their very best to kind of wiggle into Bible-believing circus, you know, circles and things. Like a little snake, they just wiggle in there. And then once they've gained the trust of people, they just start to pull people away from sound Bible preaching and start to just draw disciples to themselves and they just start to poison them and poison them and poison them. I've seen it for years and years and years. I've been on YouTube now for, I've been in ministry for 10 years, but I've been on uh, YouTube since November of 2008. So I've seen this thing so many times <laughs> down through the years. It's ridiculous. And, you know, I try to have grace and I try to let people go and try to let them kind of see one way or the other. But um, I'm praying about you know, naming somebody uh, because I'm seeing the same thing. And, and again, easy believes them. We're going back to Romans chapter 10. That's not for you and all the other stuff and changing the meaning of the scriptures. So and the reason I name these people is not so I can get glory for myself or anything else. See, that gets put on me too. It's so I can warn people uh, that they're not getting drawn away by these false prophets. Because again, you know, I've seen people who are false converts professing Christians and they come along and they'll do this whole thing and they say, you know, well, Brother Brian, you're wonderful, you're great, blah, blah. That's a problem right there. I mean, you should, you should if you've watched me long enough, you've seen me make mistakes. Don't think I'm wonderful and great. You know, esteem them very highly in love for the work's sake. I know that. The elders that rule well. I appreciate that. But what I'm saying is don't, don't put me up on too high of a pedestal. It's the book, okay? This is what you need to say. This is the best thing on earth right here. King James Bible. All right, but I've seen these people. They come along. Oh, Brother Brian, you're wonderful, blah, blah, all this stuff. And all of a sudden it's like, what do you think about Brother so-and-so? And they start watching. I'm just going, no, nope, I don't trust the guy. Well, I know, but, but, but. And away they go. I've seen that thing happen so many times. I can't tell you how many times. I mean, it's it's got to be up into the thousands of times now. 
but I've seen that thing happen with people. I have correspondence with, and, and away they go. <laughs> so watch out for salvation thieves that are telling you you don't need to ask the Lord for salvation. You come to Him and you say, you come to Him in faith. You can't see Him, so you have to have it in faith. And you say, I believe what Jesus Christ did on the cross for me. And I come to you broken. I come to you, I'm a sinner. Please save me. And He will. <laughs> you think the Lord's not going to listen to you? You come broken hearted and you say, God, please save me. I'll tell you, you know, and again, i got to say this, because I've thought about, a lot about this. You know, again, I've read a lot of things, Christians in the past and stuff. They would agonize over salvation. It was a major deal. And these are people that have never seen pornography, never saw movies. They never saw anything like that. We're talking people in the 1700s, 1800s, you know, some even back before that. And they would just agonize about salvation. God, I'm so wicked. And I'm going, <laughs> you know, these people are concerned about their salvation. And yet people today, it's just this flippant thing. What, oh, you know, da, 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 da. Oh, what do I got to do? Believe that? The, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I, I, yeah, I believe he died for me. Yeah, okay, I got to get back to doing, you know, whatever. People need to be serious about salvation. It's the most important decision that you have to make in your life. But it's just this, oh, yeah, just, just believe. No, no, no prayers, no, just, just, yeah, it's done. Yeah, you're good. Watch out for salvation thieves. 